Hey, welcome everybody to another episode of FCP.co Live. It is my sincere pleasure to be able to do this. And I want to um, thank everybody for being here. Uh, we got a whole whole bunch of people here. And I'm going to introduce everybody in just a moment. But before we get going, I want to um, thank our sponsors. And I have some extra buttons I have to hit over here. So first, I want to thank uh, the good people at OWC. Um, they make great hard drives. They have all kinds of enterprise storage solutions, plenty of great stuff. And uh, we're very excited that they are uh, a part of uh, making all of this happen. And I have another button here. I also want to thank Industrial Revolution, maker of great plugins available on F uh, FX Factory. And uh, if you aren't familiar with those plugins and the entire FX Factory ecosystem, I would highly, highly recommend uh, that you go check that out. Now I have to turn that button off and I'm back. And um, today we're talking about kind of two ends of the spectrum in the Final Cut world. We're going to talk about learning Final Cut and a great new way to learn about it. And then we're going to talk about what I consider to be a very kind of high-end thing. I've never done this. And uh, that's actually what Daniel uh, is here for. So let, let's let's introduce our, our crowd here. I think that gives you, I think everybody, you should be able to see everybody. So we got Peter Wiggins from a little software company called Industrial Revolution. And down in the, and actually, if you don't know this, on Zoom, everybody's view is different. And so it's going to be different for every single person. But anyway, Sam Messman, my good friend, uh, kind of the, uh, I would consider sort of the godfather of the Final Cut uh, community. I don't know that he agrees with that. It's, it's but... like being the godfather of a small business, you know? A... <laughs> no, I got to say, man, the, the running into you at NAB all those years ago, I don't know if, Anybody knows this? I, I was in the back of like the South Hall, just wandering around, and it was it was a dark era in the Final Cut world that year, and I couldn't find any Final Cut ten in NAB. And all of a sudden, I look over and I see this monitor. I'm like, oh my goodness, there's Final Cut on that monitor. And I walk up to it, and all that of a sudden, After Effects. This guy, <laughs> What's that? It's like, was that After Effects? What is this? No, yeah. no, no. It was Final Cut. <laughs> No, but all of a sudden, Sam literally pops up from behind this counter and goes, oh, hey. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't even know who you were working with or who you were representing then. But Oh, it was uh, LumaForge. It was OG LumaForge uh, on the Exasan booth. And I learned that year. It was my first year at NAB. I learned that year at NAB. You don't want to work on the floor at NAB. That was that was. It's, it's brutal, isn't it? If, if, you want to keep, if, you, if you want to keep your voice for, for three days. Yeah, it, I had no idea what I was getting into. I didn't even know what NAB was that year until my first year there. That was literally, really? I yeah, I had no idea. Um, and was that your year. first NAB the year that we met? That was, that was 100%. And I did everything wrong right down to staying at Circus Circus. <laughs> <laughs> The what rooms are very be more fun than there, staying though. at a place called Circus Circus. Who doesn't I, love a circus? I did everything wrong. It was uh, amazing. All right. And then we have Daniel Fabello and uh, Daniel and I. Uh, hey, Daniel, how is uh, you're down in Austin, correct? That's correct. Yeah. So we were chatting before we went live and I realized I said to Daniel, I said, hey, do you know a guy named David Fabello? And he goes, yeah, it's my brother. So uh, David was actually the first guest I ever had, the first guest I ever recorded for the old podcast, Final Cut Grill. And so it's uh, fitting that you're here today, Daniel. And then, of course, my dear friend, Michael Matstorff. How are you, Mike, today? Hey, Chris, I'm good, man. How's that? I, I still, really, you guys, you guys are really want to show that much ceiling. I, I'm, a, I'm offended. I'm a, I mean, from Sam, I've come to expect it. It's the best it. I can do. It's the best. I, well, thought, I, I take all my cues from I, Sam. That's I've not true. So do. that's not true. So Mike, Mike, you guys, you are you and Mr. Yanovich, who's might be bopping in. We're hoping. You guys just produced a what is it? Five part, six part series? Yeah. Well, it, yes, it's five parts. Um, we we put it out on YouTube. Uh, the next ep two episodes came out this morning. Um, we dropped a trailer. Trailer is a strong word, but just a, a pitch a few days ago. 
And um, three more episodes are coming out this week, just day after day. So one, two, three, tomorrow, the next day, the next day. How, what, what, how would you describe the, and what is the subject? What, what are you guys talking about? Um, well, bird watching in North America. Interesting. Is what we're going, for. no, not that. <laughs> um, we, uh, people are always complaining about like, oh, Final Cut, blah, blah, blah. You know, we all had this conversation and these battles. And my thing was always education. And, you know, we always talked about the fact that one thing that's irritating about Final Cut is you can't really apply your knowledge from prior history in the same ways you could from, you know, Premiere to Avid to Final Cut 7 to Media 100 to whatever. And so I kept having the same conversation with people over and over and over again. And one of the people I had the conversation with was Mike Yanovich, who went from being a uh, an Avid, uh, full-time Avid editor, and he still works on the Avid, of course, we all do, um, to a nutbag for Final Cut. And he just loves it and can't get enough of it and wants to tell every tell the world about <laughs> anyway so he and i are old old friends and we decided i i had i had written up this sort of curriculum what i would what i would tell people and um so basically instead of uh, trying to go through the proper channels to do it we just said you know i i called him up and i said you want to do this let's just explain it to people who don't get it because i was one of them and uh i think a lot of people are one of them and they get frustrated because they don't get it. And so that's who these videos are for. These are what I'm calling them is like conversations about how it works, what it is, how it applies to other things. And that's basically it. Yeah. I would say, um, uh, after much headache last night, uh, you actually got me a copy of, of a couple of the episodes and I found them to be, super easy to watch like it was I one and, and it may be because i know you and i know michael uh yanovich to a degree so i felt like i was just hanging out in your suite and you were you know explaining it and, and, and especially the intro the intro video is perfect um tell me a little bit about how you how you did that or or, or what you were setting up in the intro video in the little short uh, the yeah. pitch video? No, well, no, 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 not funny. the pitch, but, but like episode one. Ex explain episode one. Oh, well, that one. introduces the platform. Well, what right. we did, what I did was this. I had this gigantic uh, document, which I wrote up while walking down the street to send to one of the guys at Apple about like how I would teach things. And so then I went back through that and kind of was thinking about, okay, how do you introduce the platform? What do you do? Um, and I figured out, okay, well, there's the three major sections of Final Cut, you know, the browser, the viewer, and the timeline. And each one of those has a million things attached to it. And then they start to blend together at some point. And so the idea is first episode, just go over the whole thing and explain what it does in plain terms. Like, oh, this is where you import your media. This is how you can mark things up. This is how you can view your favorites. This is where you look at stuff. This is where how, what the timeline is and basically what it does. So we just tried to cover the, the big sections of it and what it does in comparison to other things. Um, once we got through that, then we were gonna delve into each of those sections in detail. And that's what the subsequent videos are. Gotcha. So um, yeah, when I was watching it, you know, like I said, very easy to watch. And I think a lot of tutorial stuff ends up being, um, a little too scripted and it's actually kind of interesting <laughs> you I mean, couldn't be less scripted <laughs> <laughs> no what's fascinating is you, you said that you would you had basically written out this whole proposal and had an outline and it doesn't it doesn't feel like that at all and and not in a bad no. way you know no. i mean i think that when things are too scripted it's just it's like yeah well that's why I, you know paragraph that's why i changed the sort of the, I mean, Peter, I know up on the site, you put tutorials this morning and I, I really call them conversations because we're just talking about it and talking about what it does and why it works and why it's a good idea. And so for me, that was more important than showing someone how to do something in particular because everyone's going to have their own systems and their own pipelines and all that. And so 
if they knew it, what it could do and how to get there, then they could apply all of that to their own situation. Right. Um, I, I can always change it to conversations if you want. You know, if you, if you feel that bad about it, I'll, uh, I'll, I can change it. I leave that to you, Peter. I, I think, you know, what, what I, but I agree with what Chris just said. You know, two, people get tutorials and they're like, they're very specific thing. Like, how do you comp, how do you do a key green screen and, and clean it up? And how do you, you know, all these little tiny things. And Sam has done a million of them. And um, Steve and Mark, Ripple guys, done a million of them and stuff. But the, it's just, it's not really a tutorial because it's not specific, it's very broad. Um, yeah. all this stuff is just also, philosophy also what you don't want you don't you don't want the manual just read out and demonstrated you mm -hmm. want you want some i think for me a good tutorial shows the understanding of how it you know of, of of how it all works and oh by the way you know there's this and i wouldn't do it that way i can i do it this way and you know uh, rather mm -hmm. than just you start here th follow all the steps and you look yeah look what you've made yeah, well, I think that's, you know, right now I'm working on this show. It's an avid show. And it's what, what I'm noticing is I, I stepped in for somebody who's having to leave. And it, what I'm noticing is like, you know, I don't know exactly how they did everything. I'm going through and looking at stuff and, and figuring it out based on what I, my prior knowledge. And I think that's all that people can do. And that's how we learned Final Cut in the first place. It's okay. How we made all of our best guesses and then some of them were right, some of them were wrong, and then we adjusted as we went. And so just knowing the capabilities and the capacity, I think, is what's important for people. You know, uh, first of all, I commend you for being able to just step into uh, an avid edit. I, I've said it many times. I just I don't have the bandwidth myself to try and be fluent in multiple platforms. I think that's part sometimes I, I'm considered to be, you know, thick headed or a fanboy, whatever, but I just, I just don't want to do it. Um, do you find that moving to avid, like the, that there's a giant slowdown factor? Well, I think there's, there's different for, kinds for of example, operations that, yeah. For example, we always talk about how, wow, Final Cut's so fast. Do you absolutely feel it when you have to go sit in it at an avid? Um, well, you know, in respect to editing, yeah, it's slower to edit. Every everything is slower about it. The organization is is slower, um, but it's it's used for different purposes. I mean, in truth, like, and I was going to bring this up if you did. So thank you, Chris. There's the stuff that gets that's important in in these big avid shows is pipeline. Like this is an animated movie, and there's visual effects, there's 3D stuff, there's animation coming in, there's uh, layout coming in. There's all these different things and they all integrate with particular information that's spit up by the Avid and how the files are named and all that. And there's all these giant integrated pipelines that could be done in Final Cut, but no one has taken the time to do it. And I think that's one of the places it struggles. So is it slower? Yeah, but it's not just about the editing. So it's, it's yeah. about the entire uh, picture of what's happening. So Daniel, out of curiosity, yeah. do you edit on any other platforms besides Final Cut? Not since 2015. I like ever since I was shown by my brother how to use Final Cut, I was and I worked at I worked at Rooster Teeth for seven years. So I start I actually walked into my first job there working in Final Cut 7 and then I got hired on an animation project in Premiere and ha had never touched Premiere before. So on the job, I had to learn Premiere. It's basically a carbon copy of FCP7, so who cares? But I was like, I just had to learn that on the fly. Um, but no, I actually tried recently to open up Premiere because Austin, a lot of Austin uses Premiere for the most part. It doesn't have the infrastructure for Avid um, in the same way. I mean, there are Avid projects for sure. Um, but I just can't go back. It's just like, it's the same way when when you're describing how, you know, if Avid is slower, it has different pipelines and things like that. It's very hard for me to unwrite what I've learned from X and know like, well, I can do this in the timeline. Why can't I do this here? And it gets very frustrating. So I end up banging my head against the desk <laughs> with- Yeah, well, I, that's, that's the thing, Daniel. And you, you hit the nail right on the head with the fact that there's an unlearning curve that takes place with people. And you can't, 
just apply your knowledge and feel comfortable. Like, you know, you went from, uh, you went from wherever to premiere and you're like, Oh, I got it. And that's the attitude right. that of everyone. And, but people, when they get to final cut 10 from somewhere else, they're banging their head against the wall because they don't, it just doesn't register. Well, and then I spoke to, I was at, I actually met Sam at NAB one year. I think it was 2017 or something. Uh, <laughs> and Steve Bays and the Ripple training guys and a couple of I've heard people. many, many stories that start exactly like that. Wow. One yeah. year at NAB, I met this guy <laughs> named Sam Messman. Well, and it, well, and what was interesting talking to them was, and because I have also, I, and I can get into it depending on how much time we have, but like I've had a, I've had to fight to get my, cause I'm as a writer director, I learned at CP um, with my co-editor, Sarah, and we decided this is both economically better, faster, all of these things. But everybody above us was like, no, no, no. Cause people don't know it. So I had to fight for years to get, to get my stuff or to get anything made in it. And then when it was my project, I was like, well, I get to choose, <laughs> you know? So, so I've created pipelines galore. Um, but um, the thing that I had to do was teach people, you know, I had to teach edit freelance editors um, or learning with Sarah or like all of these different things. And the wall that people hit, you know, is like when they're in that timeline and they're trying to figure out. Um, and it's really interesting, even people who use Final Cut 10 on, on my previous show that finished airing this, uh, this winter or spring was they, they often still revert to their premiere sensibilities and like use, use a slug on the, on the primary and then just work in the secondary. And you're like, you're just, you're just, you're just crippling yourself. You're just like, you, just, you have to embrace it. You know, <laughs> I think you bring up a good point though, is, um, the problem is I think the good teaching is not really readily available. So people will start trying to, if, if you just download something and say, I heard some things about this, people will probably download the app and they will start trying to use it like the app that they've used before. And then we'll quickly decide that it doesn't do anything they want it to do. And it's not going to work <laughs> because no one actually showed them how to use it properly right down to the point where like I used to go around and, even with a bunch of LumaForge customers, like they'd be using it and I'd be, I would be amazed at the stuff they didn't know in the way that this was being done. And I think, uh, unfortunately, video literacy when it comes to editing really on any platform, I don't think is particularly high because it has previously been such a complex enterprise, whether it's on the Avid, Premiere, or Resolve side to really just break through the door in the first place and really understand something. And then on the Final Cut side, it hasn't been properly documented in professional atmospheres in a way that people can really engage around it. So you just have this like frustration curve, I think, no matter what you're using or people trying to turn around content and constantly running into these issues that are pretty easily resolvable if you know things, but you don't know many people who know those things unless you're in sort of our little circle. So Mike, as you teach people, what are the, what do you see are the biggest hurdles where they finally like get it? You, do you know what I mean? Does that make, does the question make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, I don't spend a ton of time teaching people, to be honest, Chris, but I, when I, what I find is that convincing them to let go, which is what I had to do, like I was one of those guys who bought it and then sent it back because I was aggravated. Um, you you used the term, to let go of, you said of what the they want to do. Yeah, you said the unlearning curve. I thought that was really interesting. I've yeah. never heard anybody mention that before. Yeah. Yeah, it, that's, uh, I say that whenever anyone asks me, because I, I think one of the things, I'm not sure which episode it's in that we did, but it was a simple exercise of people like who like to use audio dissolves. And it, it creates this whole snowball effect. And like anybody who comes from Avid or Premiere, they, yeah, I want to put an audio dissolve there because I want it to fade up. And so the way Final Cut marries the picture and the sound, then you have like an issue with, uh, no, I don't want to dissolve the picture. I just want the audio. Well, then I better detach it. So then I detach it. And then I'll dissolve these two things. But then why can't I control these two things at one time? And it's just this whole aggravating uh, circle of hell. And so we went through the time and trouble to take like two minutes to say, okay, 
if you want to do the audio dissolve, yeah, just don't do it. You know, you could hear some keyframes or even better yet, here's your fade handles. And little things, teaching them to, to not go where they want to go immediately is the hard part because everybody likes to go where they want to go. Yeah, Chris, I would can agree. I, can I just say, I think Michael is in the attendees. If you want to promote him to a panelist. Ah, yes, I will. Absolutely. It could, it could of course, be somebody masquerading as Ooh. Michael, but hopefully it is Michael. Ah, I don't think so. Let's see. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Which would be no. funny if it was. Promote to panelist. And we, we have a few have moments to talk to. Is he going to pop in here? There we go. <clears throat> so, <laughs> Michael, you can turn on your uh, mic. I know that you, for security reasons, you're not allowed to turn <laughs> your camera on. We understand. How you doing, Mike? Your, your mic is off. Wait, no, you're muted, Mike Yanovich. Unmute. There uh, you go. Okay. I think I just turned my... Okay, good. We can hear you. Hey guys. Sounds like Michael Yanovich oh is being held hostage by the Cylons. <laughs> so yeah, I'm at work right now to keep this brief, but I wanted to... good. I... This isn't going to work, is it? <laughs> Check one there. Yeah, we no. can kind of oh, we kind of make it out. Terrible. Let me ask you a question. Let's see if you can answer the one question. Nope. Can you hear me, Mike? <laughs> I hear you. I don't think you, if you guys hear me. If you keep talking, it actually, the stream kind of picks up. Okay. Why don't you, why don't, we'll ask well, you one question and we'll see if it works. How did you guys come about doing this project together? 100% Mastorp's idea. He, you know, he brought it up and I loved it. I, I did a, an article on No Film School with a video um, not quite a year ago. And I'm completely into Final Cut because I'm at Surf in the first place. So when he saw I'd done that and he had this idea. It's coming, this is, going. This is bad television. Kind of yeah. not I, doing I, I can I can finish tutorial. it. And I'm sure he has talked about this because there's enough tutorials out there, but just a broad math talk. I'm gonna I'm gonna watch the replay later, guys. <laughs> let's let let's let Mike ask <laughs> answer the question because it's it's not it's not a good connection, Michael. Um, for for the for everybody, I'm just gonna let you know that when it comes to streaming video, you absolutely want to be on Ethernet. I just I, I realize you're just bopping in from work so mike answer that answer that question uh how did it come about that you guys came to do this together well um i thought it would be fun i wasn't working at the time i just asked mike if he wanted to do it um the last time i asked him to do something like this was um it was for an ace event where i pitched it to a friend at the ACE and pitched it to Luke and Judd at Apple and everybody got together and made, uh, set up a bunch of computers and we made a presentation at Universal Studios, the studio studio, not the amusement park, um, to a bunch of uh, editors with me and uh, Billy Fox uh, and Mike. And I, that was right when Mike was learning the software and I said, do you want to do a, be on this panel? And he said, well, what if I don't like it? And I said, well, be honest, just don't be a jerk. Um, and so he, we sat up there and he fielded questions and he went from um, like, and I think I mentioned this somewhere, but he went from skeptic, pure skeptic to interested, to curious, to a fanatic over the yeah, course it, of about a month. And you're talking about his, his take on Final Cut. Yeah. 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 I, 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 think, I think it all has to do with that learning curve or the learning what wall or what, what uh, you I, call I, it. I think it's def I think it's definitely a, a, a learning capital e capital e plus six four six nine zero nine. Sorry, my, it, my eight year old had an issue. I'm sorry. I just just for the record, please tell me you didn't just give somebody your password for to something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's it's, it's my local uh, Wi Fi. It's E E plus <laughs> <laughs> and some numbers. <laughs> 
<laughs> we'll just yeah. edit that part out, right, Chris? We're taping this. We're gonna. Yeah, that's. Yeah, okay. we'll, we'll, we'll cut that out when it you goes out for ch- real. You might want to we'll change, change that. <laughs> okay. But I, I think I know Sam. You've said this before that it's actually easier teaching Final Cut to people who've never edited before than it is to to people who uh, come locked into. You know, I've worked. At, I, I, I tend to see it. I tend to see people who come and work Final Cut, and they go, "I've worked Avid. I've worked Premiere. I can work this." And you're going, "Well, actually." Unless you kind of go and watch some training, you're probably not going to be able to work it. I literally have taught elementary school kids to do multicams faster than spending multiple days with a avid editor in their 50s. It literally, like an avid professional in their 50s will fight me every step of the way about needing (laughs) me to justify the existence of a button and a control and give me an endless story over how they do something. It's like, yeah. Great. Why am I here if you don't need my help? But I'm here because you wanted me to help you. So you could just let me show you and shut up for a second. Or I'll just go back and work with the elementary school kids. <laughs> Will you please do me a favor, Sam? Will you hide a camera in one of those training sessions for me someday? Because I, I would just, like to watch that. Honestly, like I used to be more respectful just because I guess I needed to be paid to have my time wasted with them. However, since I don't anymore, I think the truth is I'd rather just get on with my life with people who don't want to fight me every step of the way. Yeah, I get it. So, you know, there's a theme that I have. There's two themes that have been running through my head recently. Matsdorf is laughing. Or he's he's still working on the password. Um, Those those two themes are, uh, number one, it's the death of old technology and the acceptance of new. And I see this, I've, I've watched this story happen time and time again in my own career, going all the way back to the, the death of, Peter will remember, video cameras with tubes in them. And I remember in those old days, like the camera people were like, I, I, I don't like those Sony chip cameras, they're crap, I'll never, I'll never use those. Well, those guys are all retired now or they're not working in the business or they've gone on to selling real estate because they weren't willing to adopt and change. Yeah, um, Chris, but just to push back on that a little bit, that's, yeah. I think that's different. That you, What you're equating in, in this industry is like going from cutting on tape or cutting on film to cutting digital. And I think there's a difference. Like the there's... The Avid is, is perfectly fine for editing. Premiere is perfectly fine. I'm sure Resolve is perfectly fine for editing. Um, and there's there's other things that play into it. Those There's in, integrations that have been developed because those things exist. And there's industries and systems and, and all sorts of things that are in place because of it. So I, I don't think it's like, oh, one thing is, I mean, I'll just say it plainly and objectively, Final Cut is better to edit on than anything. Just I, can, I think that's a, a safe thing to say. Um, oh, but absolutely. it doesn't play we, we totally well with others nearly as well as other things. So you're and saying it's important. You're saying that, that, let me get this straight. Cause I think what I heard you say is that final cut does not play well with other systems in integ- integrated systems than others. Well, I'm like, that's what I'm saying. And the integrated systems that I'm referring to are the giant pipelines that are required to make television and film. Yeah. Look, Agreed. I think, Mike makes a good point, honestly, which is very accurate, which is for the infrastructure that has been built uh, for high end uh, production and TV. The reality is um, when the post-production budget that you have is a microscopic sliver of your overall budget. uh, And this is something, you know, frankly, we found on focus way back in the day where it was just, there was no, incentive to really change when the amount of money you save is a rounding error in comparison to the larger (laughs) budget you know and this is the and this is the case where like you know the catering budget is bigger than the post-production budget in many cases so why are you going to change this giant ecosystem of vendors and all these things when basically you know you're not going to make that much more money however for a person or a small business or a company who's dependent on a workflow and their roi on a piece of content is significantly lower they are forced to look at more innovative ways of doing things because they don't have the same amount of money to spend on something and they don't have the same number of people and uh 
you know, infrastructure that's already in place that needs to be adapted into this. So that's why Final Cut is significantly more impactful in small business, in education, in places where people just need to get things done and they just need a basic workflow to just go versus a high end uh, video enterprise that relies on giant teams. You know, it's the same reason you, people aren't going to use Zoom or Slack, you know, with, with big corporate business because they have a different set of needs. They're probably going to use Microsoft Teams. Can I, yeah, can over, I, oh. go, Daniel. Well, I wanted to add to that because, and, and we consulted with LumaForge a little bit back in the day, but we, I had to make an argument to do, and it, it surprisingly wasn't met with too much um, resistance from my co-director and the CEO of Rooster Teeth. But when I made Laser Team 2, which is a multi-million dollar movie, we, me and Sarah were like, well, we got to do this in Final Cut. And we only had, we, the turnaround time on that movie was very fast. It was like eight or nine weeks or something. Uh, and, and, or I, I can't remember, but it was very fast. And there were only two people on the post team. And then I would also jump in editing, right? But like three people turn that multi-million dollar movie through that pipeline. And I don't think we could have done it with um, a different NLE because A, it, we were all more versed in FCB 10, although we did teach on that project, the assistant editor, how to do the entire thing. So that assistant editor in a month was a master of Final Cut. Um, and but my point is, is that it was helpful on that because we got more iterations out of our edit. And that's where we saved the time. Our quality went up because we were able to edit faster, get more rounds in, you know, and we could get like three rough cuts done or, you know, three cuts done before we had to start delivering our reels. And then we had a yeah. rolling reel delivery, right? And I that's where Sam the benefit really came in. Yeah, Sam, I've heard Sam say multiple times, you can fail faster when you can do it cheaper <laughs> and you, because you're going to have to fail a few times before you, before you hit it. Well, so, right. oh, yeah. And I just wanted to say real quick sure. is that I think FCB 10 uh, to Mike's point and Sam's point maybe is not a Hollywood platform, even though I think it could be, but it is great for independent film at up to a certain budget level or crew size really. And I cannot believe, especially in Austin, and maybe this is my fault because I need to promote it more. But like documentaries, this system is made for documentary. And uh, they would yeah. save so much time and money if they did it. Um, yeah. But there's a lot of resistance. because they have to uh, The only reason yeah. I adapted it is independent film collective. Efficient way to get people's free projects done that I wasn't getting paid for. So <laughs> I was always looking for an edge, you know, to sort of go in and, and figure out how to do more faster, which is not really the role and responsibility of a lot of trained professional editors because mostly they're looking for reliability stability and security and mm -hmm. a repeatable effort they're also uh typically paid by the day and by the hour and when i was a freelance editor going in and doing permalance in places i wasn't always incentivized to get things done as fast as humanly possible there's a there's a great story james branch in uh, on youtube is saying he knows of a trailer house that switched from final cut 7 to premiere purely because it had Final Cut 7 keyboard layouts. And that was the sum total of their technical assessment. <laughs> and he says, many editors are not interested in change. So yeah, that's a that's a bad way to, to choose your can, edits. Can, well, we got all these pretty can, keyboards. Can we just go to Premiere? <laughs> can I just mention, we have go, James Branch's Final Cut Pro 10 user story coming out. I think it's going to be Thursday. Oh, cool. um, I've kind of formatted it up. It's got loads of screenshots, loads of everything, but it is Final Cut Pro 10 working on a prime time BBC One series awesome. and, it all worked, and it all worked. So and awesome. it's, a, it's a great read. So thank you, James, for that. And it should be out on Thursday, hopefully um, on there. If Maybe we should. Yeah, well, I, I think to, we should just invite to... him over to Zoom someday. Yeah, well, I think if, just to riff, you know, riff if off. He, Sorry, if he, if he comes over to Zoom, then I think you know after the after the hour, he can pop in and have a quick chat about it. That's fine. Yeah, James, yeah. follow the link on uh, on uh, the, the the site, and we'll pop, we'll pop you into the the picture here if you got a camera set up. Um, Mike, what were you going to say? 
Well, I, I was going to say, you know, one thing about what Daniel was saying, what Peter was just saying is, you know, there's certainly, it's certainly as capable as anything on any size project, in my opinion. Um, the problem that we ran into and then I run into, and then I've when pitching the use of it to friends in places where they, these people could make it happen. They just say, well, there's no, there's no talent pool. What happens if you can't be there? And that's true. And that's, you oh, can't find people. True. You can't find anyone to, to who knows it at any, no, that's an overstatement. You can find a few people, but we know all of them. Um, <laughs> and, and so I think that, you know, it's, we're going to require interest from, from a, an editor, a, a lead editor on a, on a project who's willing to have his people go learn it. Who's willing to take the, cause you know, it's been done. It can be done. There's, there's no question about it, but yeah. people have to want to do it. And there has to be people that can be there to support it. And there's just not. Right. I think, I think what I was getting at earlier when I was talking about the, the theme of, you know, giant shifts in technology and whatnot is that I personally have gotten to the point where, um, I don't really have a dog in the hunt. I don't really care. And if somebody else, if my competitors choose to use Premiere over my choice of using Final Cut, uh, it's 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 none of my business. I, I realize it's different in the entertainment industry, but I'm just going to work faster and spend more time with my family is the way I look at it. Anyway, um, Daniel, I'd love to hear a little bit about the project. Now, you just released an article also on fcp.co. Um, tell us a little bit about that project. Yeah, we, um, so I wrote up the article about doing VR with the slow-mo guys and the slow-mo guys is a very popular YouTube channel. Um, I don't know. They've been doing it for a decade now and, um, they it, very simply, they shoot cool stuff in slow-mo. Um, and so I've known Gavin for years, um, as, uh, you know, he's acted in, two of my shows and laser team two. Um, and so, and we, and I was the first person to introduce him. I want to say this was 2015 or 16. I introduced him to final cut 10. Um, Cause I did at the, at rooster teeth, I did kind of an overview, a live overview for about an hour for the teams. <laughs> and the person with the biggest YouTube channel, oddly enough, cause his YouTube channel is bigger than rooster teeth. He was the one who switched. He was like, oh, done. Because I showed him the speed controls. And he was like, wait, it's that easy? And then he asked me, wait, how do I, how do I change speeds in the middle? I was like, oh, it's the blade speed tool. And he was like, this is blowing my mind. <laughs> so he went off and learned it. And now he's 100% um, using Final Cut 10, right? Um, so, so now, you know, me and him are working together and I kind of, after leaving Rooster Teeth and working with him on stuff. So anyway, he had a project with Oculus coming up and he didn't, he usually edits most of his own regular videos, but he didn't want to take on this thing, right? Which presented up front seems, oh, you're just going to make everything three, you know, 180, blah, blah. I, we had to, I had to develop the workflow from scratch because it doesn't exist in Final Cut. And, um, but I do so mention. Let's, but, but before you go on, let, let's clarify here. So sure. you did a 180 degree view in 3D. Is that correct? In 3D, yeah, it's 3D. So it's basically you have the left eye and the right eye, and there's some magic thing going on, and but but it's actually a 180 degree uh, field of view. Yes. Yeah, and you shoot. You shoot um, with the K1 Pro, has two eyeballs, and we shot with that camera, right? And it sees about 220 degrees or so, so okay. it can see behind itself. Oh, and I saw then, something in the behind the scenes video about how you had to mount it in a special way so it didn't see its own tripod, correct? Yeah, you have to lean the tripod forward so that Funny. it, because it's going to see that. Um, and then we'd have to, we, we tried to hide, we just tried to hide crew because at one point you can't hide all the equipment. It's just like, we can't <laughs> keep doing this. Um, so you have that camera and then you have the um, phantom, right? The two phantoms on a mirror rig, right? Hmm. And the mirror rig is, is gonna just shoot <clears throat> monoscopic, right? You're just shooting regular stuff. And that is going to be presented 
again, in a 180 degree field of view, but if you look at the video, it is still in a kind of letter letter box, quote unquote, right? And But it's taking up pretty much your field of view. So you can still look around the space. And within that, you have to determine how far, or how close it is, you know, basically how deep into the phantom 3D are your eyes, right? Um, is, is another, that's the convergence and the distance and things like that. So we're combining those two elements in Final Cut Pro 10, you have to use, you have to use a 360 timeline though, right? So you have this, it initially stretches your 180 footage, you crop it down um, and, and distort it to the 180, okay? And, and you just work with that, but you work basically in a 360 timeline. And then eventually, once you crop the video, because you just have to get it to the right dimensions, you create a 180. So that was actually one of the hardest parts was just figuring out, okay, how do we go from 180 to 360 back to 180, you know? Um, and so those were things that Laura was very helpful with and she's friends with Tim Dashwood. And so like they, they gave me a lot of feedback on how to do all of that stuff. And then it was basically <clears throat> the other part of the workflow was just trying to figure out how do you take the phantom footage, the mirrored phantom footage and create a workflow with multicams to make an efficient way to color, sound design, you know, get it to Laura for her to kind of position and make the two eyeballs for those. Um, and that was just practice. That was just like, okay, what works best and when to do things, you know? And I lay all that out in the article of, you know, um, of when to do that stuff. It's always, it always amazes me those projects that I think everybody's done at least one of them where you're stepping out into doing something. It's like, there's nobody I can ask to figure this out. Like I have to just figure this out. Yeah. And some of it was me watching um, Eric Chang at, at, at um, Facebook, you know, he has tutorials or he's done tutorials like, um, you know, at events and things. So he sent me those and he was like, this is a premier workflow. And so I watched them and was like, okay, well, I'm just going to figure out the, uh, the, the e equivalent way of doing it in X and sometimes the better way, you know, um, of doing it. So I, I had a baseline just in a different NLE, you know. Can, can you just run me through? Cause I obviously I read the articles cause I formatted it up and it's a great article that goes into quite a lot of depth. Can you just run me through how you did the speed changes by you do you, doing a multicam again because I was slightly confused oh well oh, my writing no <laughs> um it is confusing to to write it all down so like um basically because you can't just blade footage because you're going to have to do that to both both left and right well so those translate that or they so basically the multicam workflow is I have a mirrored image and then I have the, the regular image, right? Because you have the mirror rig. And so I, I align those on top of each other. Those are sinks, but just like primary, secondary. And I have to do a lot of distortions to line those up, the eyeballs, right? So that we don't get the, the differences, okay? And then color correction, all of that. But what I do first is I just create a multicam with those sinks and then take those two multicams onto a different timeline, duplicate them, change the angles. So the, the, the angle on the bottom is A, angle on top is B. Do all of the adjustments that I need to do, right? But then what I do is I take those, th and, and the reason I move it into the second timeline is because it's just easier to view. In the multicam, you can't disable and, you know, it's just, so I take all of those things from angle B and I copy and paste them back into the multicam on angle B. Take angle A, copy and paste them on the angle A in the multicam. Then I could just delete that, right, on my next timeline and just move my one multicam, okay? And then I have, um, I have, I have a multicam with all of the all of the assets and qualities that I need, and then I just do the do the speed controls there. Once you duplicate that multicam, all those speed and change the angle, 
those speed controls are, are rippled over. Like they, they don't leave, you know? So that's the thing that, that was the power of the multicam that I found right. that made me like the light bulb went off and I was like, Oh, all of these things ripple over when I duplicate it. So that's how I can export both of those tracks to Laura very seamlessly. And I, I don't know how it works in other programs, but that yeah. to me was just like, got it. I mean, one of my criticisms about the multicam is it's actually quite hard to color correct each angle when you've got the multicam editor open because you have to set into the, you know, you have to set to the, to monitor it. And then, you know, what you want is you'd be able to, what you want is you want the waveform or vector scope up and be able to click on, you know, com compare the two. So what I end up doing on a lot of stuff is actually mm. cutting a segment out of it, sticking it on a normal timeline, and then looking at looking at it, color correcting it with the the vector scope open, and then cutting it, then pasting the color corrections back onto the multicam. Yes. Yeah. And that that's essentially what I was doing. Yeah. Can you, Peter? Out of curiosity, I, I, it's an interesting solve. Can you? see if you open up the multicam viewer can you see changes in the multicam viewer as you're correcting in the multicam yeah, timeline yeah. yeah but it's the monitoring angle that you're looking at so right. you can select the monitoring angle and then it's always the same that one of the tracks is not long enough so you have to shorten one to look at the other and it it's it's the same, for, same, same for audio. I think the audio is not great when you're trying to monitor it in the multicam either. And also you've got pan law to be able to go back into the multicam. So if you've got a mono track, you can't really sit. You have to guess a level and then it goes into the multicam and you can check check the level. Because obviously what a lot of stuff I do is R128, et cetera. So you've got to be a bit picky about it. Um, but, you know, on the list of things you'd like is, is, is better monitoring for... It, what once when you're in the multicam editor as opposed to on on the on the timeline is yeah that's coming in 10.5 peter i have uh, inside knowledge about that and a particular okay. thing is 10.5 all the way it's the only improvement actually okay that's they spent two <laughs> years doing that to make it absolutely perfect peter yeah 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 so D daniel you mentioned that the slow-mo guys uh were really excited about the speed ramping stuff uh did you do a lot of that in this project Oh yeah, every shot is manipulated pretty much. Um, wow. And sometimes you are just doing, I'm looking at a screenshot now, like sometimes you're just using, doing the beginning of a shot and then you do the slow-mo with that bullet time and then it just plays out. Sometimes you'll right. do multiples. And then sometimes um, I did it actually a couple of times in this project and now I'm doing it more with, their, with some other stuff is that you'll do the slow motion and then you want to play it back. And so you have to cut it up, reverse the clip, right? And make right. sure the frame is okay. And then continue it, continue the action again, right? I should but have you thought do it about, all timeline. I should have thought about this. I should have had you like have something up that you could demo, you know, just because I think that I, I've, I think uh, Mike, you were talking about, or no, Sam was talking about looking over the shoulder of a Final Cut editor and you're like, how do you not know this? Like, come on. <laughs> and, and I've had that discussion with people about, about speed ramping. Like, uh, how do you, how do you not, how do you not know how this works? Mike, did you do in, in your five parts so far, do you have any discussion about speed ramping in one of them? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which, which episode? That's a good question, Chris. I don't know. <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to be either episode. I want to know how two, late three, in the week I have five. to wait a week. Um, where I can see it. Well, uh, I think if you had a computer, you could see it anytime. But wow. um, okay. uh, I think that uh, it's probably in uh, three or four. Three or four was meant to be just three, but it, it got so long. It was like, we got to cut this thing in half. It's a pig. Um, so, well, and you know, there was a couple of things that like Gavin, I taught him, like after the initial thing, we discovered that you can double click where your ripple is and then you can like change where it's you know it's a keyframe edit essentially but it's but F it's not is so... intuitive and the first time i saw that it was like oh. yeah they, they, they want to hide everything from you and it's like it, which i love because it's like okay everything's very clean but um that was one thing and then gavin and i've submitted this as a request he 
is so annoyed because we also manipulate sounds. Like every sound on my timeline when you're sound designing for slow mo is at least 50%, right? And like, but so you have to go into your viewer and click preserve, don't preserve pitch so that you get the correct sound. And it's just a hassle to go in there and click it every time where he just wants it to be a, a, a keyboard shortcut, you know? So I submitted that to Apple being like, can I please have a toggle on and off? <laughs> I think well, Mike, tell, Mike, Mike will tell you if it's in 10.5 or not. That's in 10, oh. that's in 10.5 actually, <laughs> that Second particular feature. thing. <laughs> this is our 10.5 chair. That's, that's where 10.5 <laughs> happens. I can hear helicopters in the background, Mike. <laughs> Uh, it's just normal hollywood stuff, apple dude. branded stealth helicopters it's gonna be a knock yeah. at your door mr matt Storff, please come out with your hands up um so i was thinking well, of writing to tim cook specifically and telling him about these videos actually i i don't know if he reads the emails from the uh from the outside world but i thought that would be fun everybody well, do I, that hey so <laughs> <laughs> i have a very kind of specific just a production level question it was fairly apparent that you and Mike were not in the same room when you recorded these screen flows, yeah. correct? How, how did you go actually go about doing it? Because I realized this was sort of a project born out of COVID boredom or something. Right? Yeah, well, if anyone takes the good time and trouble to, to look at my headphone setup, they might find it curious where I have two I have, I have Apple headphones plugged into two different things. Um, one of them was plugged into my laptop, which was, I was screen flowing the final cut on there and my audio. And then I had my phone up on top with another earphone into the phone so I could talk to Mike through, um, it was either Zoom or Skype. I, mean, I think it was Zoom. And so he recorded the, the, the Zoom video and separate audio for each of us just in case. And so then we sunk that all up in Final Cut. And so we had Mike and I on the same video track, but I made two uh, sync clips, one with me and my audio and one with him and his audio. And then the screen flow thing, and then just blew up around that and you know moved stuff around. It wasn't rocket science. Yeah, it that, was but. it was really it was really fun. Like when I was watching, you know, the edge of the two boxes down in the timeline, and then uh -huh. you're like, Well, well, let's talk about this. I'm like, oh, what's he gonna do? It's like, oh, we'll just move them over here. Yeah, oh, we'll you know, the box, yeah. Here. The box, I did two things with the box sliding. That was fun where the, uh, some of them were just keyframed, like, you know, in four or five frames, just like zoop, to a new place yeah. in the screen. And the other one was I just used the cube transition when we were just like cutting out a chunk to distract the viewer. So there might be two things here and then it would go and they would show up down there. So just yeah. basic stuff. And I also, nobody's, no one's commented on like the, the bike horn that I used for the intro uh, for any of it either. So. I thought well, not taking. We me haven't too seriously. commented on it yet. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I realize we have two editors doing sound design, so you know you, you kind of get a pass at a certain point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mike, Mike, have you got any plans for any more? Any more? Are you looking to branch out into specific workflow or? Um, well, I think Peter that um, straight out the gate, uh, I'm going to do. I'm, we're open to suggestions and we'll just okay. do it sort of <laughs> take a poll and see if anybody's interested in something. Um, one thing that I am going to do though, is um, I'm going to do a, a short one, which has, it's, it's very off topic as far as TV and all that's concerned, but uh, I use this tool that Rainier Stankey makes called uh, random X or something. Um, and what it does is it randomizes all the clips in the timeline and the first time I saw it, I said, well, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of <laughs> until I was meant to put together a fifth grade graduation video of my daughter's class. And I was submitted with 438 photographs. And what was the most incredible thing was I thought, my God, I'm going to have to arrange these all by every, you know, in a specific order. And then somebody's going to complain and not enough of this kid too much of that. And so I, I strung all 438 photos out in one timeline. I made them two seconds each in about two seconds. And then I exported an XML and dropped it on Rainier's little tool. And then it came back about 30 seconds later. And all 438 of those things were in random, random order. Now I had also like keyframed. I also keyworded 
all of them by who they were automatically because they were in folders. And so then I would search a keyword, select that stuff in a timeline and then apply some transition to that. And then I would go search a bunch of others and apply a different transition. And so I ended up with- So each kid had their own transition? Kind of. And so 438 randomly placed photos, all with different transitions built in the course of about 15 minutes, <laughs> which was really pretty rad. And so I, I, Rainier hooked me up with the software and I said, well, I'll, I'll give you a plug. And so I'm definitely going to do that one next. And after that, with as far as me and Mike doing stuff, um, any, you know, we're taking requests. You know, all of the tutorials that I've had in the past on my own YouTube channel, they grew out of phone calls where people say, hey, hey, Fenwick, remember that time you showed me how to do that thing? How do you do that again? I was like, mm -hmm. ah, I don't want to explain this. So, yeah. And, and I tell you, when ScreenFlow came out about whatever it was, about 14 years ago, that was like next level. It's like, ah, oh, I'm just going to make you a tutorial yeah. and do, 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 send it off to you. And yeah. Well, and I if think you listen that's, carefully, that's what this, on, yeah. That's on what some this of those from. tutorials that I did, it was like, you know, hey, Mike, I got your call about the thing. Here, here's how you do that trick or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. In some ways, it's quicker to just kind of like record yourself doing it than actually sit down and try and explain it in text. And also, mm -hmm. you know, pictures worth a thousand words, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's clearly that's... some things are better expressed verbally. Some things are, you know, fine as an audio only source. Some things are much better visually for well, sure. I, I think Sam and I, when we we were, you know, pre the focus thing, you know, we were just we would just talk through stuff. And I would say, well, can we do this? And he would say, well, you could do this. And then, well, what about this? Yeah, okay, we could do that. And there was all this back and forth about discussing what's the best way to do it. And really, that's kind of the... Right down to finding things, solutions. In, uh, right down to finding solutions in the <laughs> app that engineers didn't actually think worked. Right. Right. Where, like, kinds of stuff the, like the copy and moving events thing where it's just like, you know, necessities becomes the mother of invention because, you know, the truth yeah. is, is I didn't know how you worked and you probably were looking at me. It was like, well, OK, this is a resource, but I don't really know where this fits into what I actually need to do on a daily basis. And then actually, I think we both ended up learning a ton in terms of yeah. like um, what is practical and pragmatic and also what needs to be improved. And I think, yeah. You know, seen a lot of adaptation since then yeah and i mean I, I certainly don't know everything but i know i like to explore and i like to figure stuff out and i like to find answers that are one answer which is nice but i i think that's the idea chris you're right about just having a conversation showing something to somebody and then they get it in their own way and i i think that's if there's enough people that understand the base level of stuff and or how something works then maybe there's a little the little army can be built yeah i think it's i think it's a really good point that different people learn different ways and when i first heard that you were doing this i was like huh you know there's a lot of final cut training out there and then i watched it and i realized oh this is it's totally different. It just felt very comfortable. And I think, I think I said that earlier, it was very yeah. easy to watch. And frankly, there was, there was a couple of things, even in the episode one, I was like, I did not know that button was there. Mm. <laughs> I There's think I know that, that yeah. fairly well. You I know, that. I think actually what would be really interesting, I think just thinking about that for a second, Chris is like, well, there's a lot of training out there, but you know, if you had to go, point people to a resource that was like definitive in any way i think it would be hard and exactly. you know i think actually what's probably needed at this point is less quantity in tutorials and more specific workflow based aggregated resources where you can get pointed to and be like oh you need to do that do this 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 is probably the guy for you there well if i can add to that like one thing to consider if you do more is in in my time using it and i don't i don't know how what different types of projects you all have worked on but i've done comedy shorts to movie trailers a feature and then 16 episode tv shows right they all have different workflows and they're all you know and then documentaries are different and like i guess that's a lot to tackle with you know two editors and but 
the trailer workflow and how you use the timeline like if you use music in a certain way i was just talking about this with my brother it's like do you put music in your primary timeline do you do this instead like um how do you use metadata in this workflow so yep. those are in i know the, those are kind of high level but it's like that that's interesting because there is no tutorial out there probably for like here's how to set up your trailer you know project in yeah in I, well i think you, you're right about that daniel but here, here's what i see is valuable and why why we decided to go this way and which doesn't totally contradict what you're saying is i think we all can agree that every cutting room is going to have different methodology and different pipelines and different ways they like to do things and if there's two people on a crew or three people on a crew and they grow through and they watch this two and a half hours worth of business that mike and i just did or something like it and they can say oh all right i get it and then they can apply that to what they're doing already they're going to be a lot happier than taking someone else's word for it mm -hmm. and I, I don't think anybody should take my word for it i just think they should explore and i people when people want to learn software i say well open every menu and click on everything and see what's see what it does and so i would say just discuss have a conversation have that have the conversations that we did become part of your conversation and then take it off from there so sure i think that way people are going to work their own stuff out Mm -hmm. Apple calls uh, calls that prog progressive disclosure. It's meant mm. to be simple. That, 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 that's what uh, Steve calls it. Progressive disclosure means on the onset, it looks very simple. But as you start to open things, you begin to see all the power. Um, we're going to wrap this up now. We're at about an hour. Nobody leave yet. Um, I want to once again, hold on, i got to got some buttons over here I need to click on. I want to once again thank... Um, other world computing, uh, SSDs, giant servers, tons of stuff. They're going to be on the show soon, and we're going to talk with them about uh, all the, that they do. And, of course, um, Industrial Wait, I'm, I don't have the right thing up, I don't think. It says Industrial uh, Revolution, Peter Wiggins. Yes, yes, yes Wiggins. of course. You'll never get And, and emoji. All right. So, uh, and then Peter, you want to take over the host controls and you want to turn off the stream. So we'll see you in a couple of weeks. We'll do this again, but we're going to open up the attendee list.